Welcome to Random Review. Thank you for joining us. I'm Connie Georgiou. Deborah Goldenberg and I coordinate Random Review for Friends of the Library, which sponsors these events. Deborah, will you join me on screen and greet our audience? Hi, everyone. Hope you enjoy the review. And our library host today is Charles Dunham. He'll be fielding your questions at the end of the program. Charles, would you like to turn on your camera and say hello? Hello. Thank you for being here. A few operational details. If you're having any problems with GoToWebinar, please use the question or chat box on your control panel and we'll try to help you. We're recording this presentation, so if your issues can't be resolved, be assured that a link to the recording will be sent in your follow-up letter. Also, there'll be a link to a more polished version on the Random Review page of the library website soon. On the Random Review page, you'll, you'll also find a link to a list of library books related to today's topic created by our volunteer, Gail Gerdman. And on the same page, you can sign up to receive monthly random review email announcements. We encourage you to submit questions for our speaker at any time during the presentation by typing them into the question or chat box, and she'll answer as many as we have time for at the end of the program. I'd like to thank our community sponsors of the Random Review Program, Grassroots Books and Music, Northwest Graphic Imaging, and the Corvallis GT. And a big thank you to the best library, and especially librarians Charles Dunham, Bonnie Brzozowski, and Mike Hansen, who provide indispensable support in the presentation of our virtual programs. Next month's review will be on April 13th when Randall Milstein, OSU faculty member and astronomer in residence, will discuss the book, The Smallest Lights in the Universe, a memoir by Sarah Seeger. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's reviewer of the second founding, Marisa Chappelle. Dr. Chappelle has been at OSU since 2005. She's an associate professor of history and serves as director of the History Master's Program. She's also on the Executive Council of United Academics of Oregon State University, the Faculty Union. Marisa's love of history goes way back to when her dad was an officer in the US Air Force and she spent some of her elementary school years living in England and traveling around Europe. This early experience was followed years later by the influence of an exceptional high school history teacher. Marisa was a declared history major from her first day in college at Emory University, where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a, with a Bachelor of Arts in History. She earned a PhD from Northwestern University. Dr. Chappelle is a historian of 20th and 21st century US politics, social policy, and social movements. She's the author of The War on Welfare, Family, Poverty, and Politics in Modern America, and co-author of Welfare in the United States, A History of Documents. She's also published in scholarly journals as well as popular outlets like the Washington Post. She's currently writing a book about the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now, known by the acronym ACORN which from 1970 to 2010 helped low and moderate income people organize to win tangible improvements in their communities. And if you've been following Random Review for a number of years, you may remember her wonderful review of Isabel Wilkerson's first book, The Warmth of Other Sons. Marisa and her husband, an associate professor of veterinary medicine at OSU, live in Corvallis. They have two sons, Everett, with a recent degree in outdoor adventure leadership, is pursuing work at a ski resort and as, as a rafting guide. And Rowan is a fourth grader at Garfield Elementary. In her spare time, Marisa enjoys cooking and baking with her son Rowan and walking her dog. Her leisure reading, reading taste leans toward mystery novels. <music> 
With her background in, in the history of American social policy and social movements, Dr. Chappelle is an ideal reviewer for the second founding. Marisa, please join me on screen. Hi, thanks, Connie. All right, I would like to begin today with a land acknowledgement. I am speaking to you from Corvallis, Oregon, which is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampanefu Band of Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to the reservations in Western Oregon. And today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde community and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. All right, now I'm going to try to share my slides and I'll get going on the book. Um, we practiced this. Apologies, y'all. I'll get it going in a minute. I'm so sorry. Charles, could you give me a hand? Sure. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, y'all. It's my first time using GoToWebinar, <laughs> and we did actually practice it, um, but I definitely should have practiced it more. Okay. Now, y'all see my slideshow? So, the way that I know is um, you got it. I got it. Okay. Apologies, everyone. All right. Uh, here we go. In his book, The Second Founding, How the Civil War and Reconstruction Remade the Constitution, Eric Foner quotes an African-American in California reacting to the Emancipation Proclamation. Everything among us indicates a change in our condition. Our relation to this government is changing daily. The revolution has begun and time alone must decide where it is to end. It is this revolution and particularly its manifestation in the three reconstruction amendments to the US Constitution that Foner explores in this book published in 2019 and winner of a Pulitzer Prize. One of the giants in the field, Foner spent the last half century writing, teaching, and speaking on US history. Here's a crazy list of books. It's intimidating. Uh, he's done prodigious research and written extensively, particularly on the Reconstruction era. He's also been an important public voice, offering perspectives on history and its relationship to the present moment in The Nation and NPR and The Guardian and The New Yorker, etc. Today, I'll offer an overview of Foner's book, his arguments, his analysis of the amendments and their consequences, and what it all means. Foner recaptures for public readership the transformation that was Reconstruction, a moment so profound that many at the time believed it represented a second founding for the nation, and Foner agrees. He reminds us that the Constitution itself offered no guidance to policymakers seeking to remake the nation. How would they incorporate formerly enslaved people and secessionist states into the body politic? In Foner's telling, then, we encounter this period that many of us kind of think we know with fresh eyes. We reject facile assumptions about inevitability, and we appreciate historical contingency. We get a firsthand seat to the remarkably broad and participatory debate among Americans in and outside of government, what scholars call popular constitutionalism, about the meaning of freedom, the definition of citizenship, and the role of the national government in giving life to those concepts. 
The book's preface and introduction lay out Foner's big picture and situate readers in this historic moment. He argues that the Civil War resulted in a fundamental transformation of American democracy. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were not mere additions to the Constitution. They created a fundamentally new document with a new definition of both the status of Blacks and the rights of all Americans. These amendments launched a process of severing citizenship from the concept of race, and they provided Americans with new claims to a broad set of rights. Also, they asserted the primacy of the national government in protecting those rights. Fona reminds us that before the Civil War, Americans viewed the national government as the biggest potential threat to liberty. Consider the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, all of which begin with Congress shall make no law to do one thing or another. Reconstruction reversed course, making the national government what radical Republican Charles Sumner called the custodian of freedom. In his introduction, which he calls Origins of the Second Founding, Foner locates these new ideas about citizenship rights and democracy in the expansive vision of antebellum black politics and abolitionism. Long before 1865, he shows, African Americans and white abolitionists articulated an egalitarian constitutionalism that identified a broad range of procedural and substantive rights, including birthright citizenship and equal protection of the laws, and that looked to the national government as the appropriate guarantor of those rights. In three subsequent chapters, Foner traces the path of each amendment in turn. He describes the specific political contexts, the debates, the conflicting ideas and compromises, and competing interpretations. What's remarkable to me in reading this book is how rapidly these expansive ideas about citizenship rights and federal power move from the margin to the center of American political culture. When you read the book, it's kind of hard to believe that the heart of Foner's story, the kind of revolution he traces, took place largely across a decade of history. The amendments and the legislation implementing them, Foner wrote, went far beyond what most Americans had thought possible or desirable in 1865. People who entered the Civil War as moderates emerged committed to remaking the South's political, economic, and social system. Opponents of Black suffrage in 1865 came to support it a few years later. Those who rejected federal prohibition of discrimination by private businesses at the outset of Reconstruction voted for the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which did precisely that. In a fourth chapter, Foner traces the retreat from the expansive promise of Reconstruction and its consequences. So let's turn to the amendments. The 13th Amendment, right, seems obvious. It abolished slavery, inevitable outcome of the war. But it wasn't a given that there would be such an amendment. Boner tells us that some Republicans argued that Congress could and should simply abolish slavery through legislation. This was a much easier process than amending the Constitution. But others had the foresight to recognize that what could be abolished through legislation could be restored through legislation. An amendment would be much safer against changing political winds. Lincoln himself was initially non-committal on the 13th Amendment. It was only when a breakaway faction of Republicans nominated John C. Fremont to challenge Lincoln, and they called for an, an amendment not only abolishing slavery, but establishing absolute equality before the law, that Lincoln threw his support behind a more limited 13th Amendment. It also wasn't entirely clear what it meant to abolish slavery, beyond, of course, the important step of establishing a new fundamental right to personal freedom. Foner shows us that the amendment held a lot more potential than that. It's clear in congressional debate and public discussion that even moderate Republicans saw the amendment as meaning more than just the personal freedom of not being enslaved. The New York Tribune's interpretation reflected a Republican consensus that the 13th Amendment empowered Congress and federal courts to protect every American in the full enjoyment of his liberties. Practically, this meant that the amendment prohibited 
not just slavery, but also the so-called badges and incidents of slavery. That is the racist practices and policies that stemmed from and maintained the logic of chattel slavery. We see this intent in the congressional effort to implement and enforce the 13th Amendment as authorized here by Section 2. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 asserted birthright citizenship, which severed race from citizenship. And it enumerated a long list of rights that all citizens possessed, from the right to marry and own property, to the right to testify in court and enjoy the full and equal benefits of laws. This legislation shows us that a majority of legislators interpreted the 13th Amendment as ensuring a broad range of rights protected by federal power. In fact, it occurred to me reading this that widespread consensus on this interpretation of the 13th Amendment could have made the 14th and 15th Amendments largely unnecessary. But President Andrew Johnson's recalcitrance and the virulent counter-revolution in the South that he encouraged and enabled convinced congressional Republicans that legislation was not a strong enough avenue to give substantive meaning to emancipation. The rights of formerly enslaved people, and of people more broadly, must be enshrined in the Constitution. The 14th Amendment was designed to do that. It's a long and complicated amendment. It was the result of intensive debate, negotiation, and compromise. And we're just going to look at the first two sections. Right. Much of the meat of the 14th Amendment is in Section 1 which incorporated ideas from the Civil Rights Act to create a national definition of citizenship that carried with it certain rights that could not be abridged. If you look at, the, if you look at section one, right, the first sentence establishes birthright citizenship. This statement offered a powerful repudiation of the Dred Scott decision, which had written Black Americans out of citizenship, and of American naturalization law, which reserved the right to become a citizen to people deemed white. The provision, Fona writes, remains an eloquent statement about the nature of American society, a powerful force for assimilation of the children of immigrants, and a repudiation of a long history of racism. This next part, it states that no state shall make or enforce any law that abridges the privileges and immunities of citizens. Well, what are the privileges and immunities of citizens? That was language that had already appeared in the Constitution and it was chosen because of its familiarity, but it left many questions unanswered. Just what were those privileges and immunities? And were these privileges and immunities protected only from direct abridgment by the states or was the government obliged to protect them from abridgment by private citizens? The next part stated, that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This is a statement of procedural equality, suggesting that African Americans would no longer be subject to the whims and prejudices of local and state authorities. Over time, federal courts applied due process to the provisions of the Bill of Rights, which had initially applied only to the federal government, and eventually articulated additional entitlements, including the right to privacy. Finally, section one stated that no state shall deprive any person of the equal protection of the laws. As we've seen, this echoed language long used by African Americans, but was far from self-explanatory. Section two of the 14th Amendment was an effort to solve a real political problem. The end of slavery nullified the three-fifths clause of the Constitution, which had allowed slaveholding states to count three-fifths of their enslaved population when calculating representation in Congress and the Electoral College. If Southern states without slavery continued to deny black men the vote, white Southern Democrats would be even more overrepresented in these bodies. Congressional Republicans ended up with this section too. They reduced a state's representation if they limited voting. They hoped that the threat of reduced representation would convince Southern Democrats to enfranchise Black citizens. Foner argues that this provision indicates that Republicans were unwilling to break completely with the traditions of federalism, which had left voting qualifications to the states. <clears throat> 
Now, the introduction of the word male into the Constitution for the first time angered women suffrage activists who rightly saw this constitutional moment as a once in a lifetime chance to win woman suffrage or more expansively universal suffrage. But legislators largely ignored their pleas and had little compunction about reserving the vote to men. Meanwhile, radical Republicans and black Americans denounced the provision for essentially acknowledging that states had a right to disenfranchise portions of their adult populations. Thaddeus Stevens acknowledged the amendments imperfections, writing, it falls short of my wishes, but I believe it is all that can be obtained in the present state of public opinion. I will take all I can get in the cause of humanity and leave it to be perfected by better men in better times. But Foner reminds us of the latent potential. The federal government has never implemented Section 2, not when Southern states disfranchised a majority of their male populations in, after 1890, or in our own times when various voter suppression mechanisms effectively disenfranchised many poor minority and urban voters. Foner then points out a profound irony in the amendment's journey to ratification. Oops, sorry. President Johnson urged Southern legislatures to reject the amendment, which they did. These governments were also putting former Confederate leaders in power, passing racist and oppressive laws to reimpose a racial caste system, and at best allowing, allowing widespread terrorism against African Americans and white Republicans. All of this convinced even moderate Republicans uh, that the only way to ensure loyal governments in the South, secure equal rights for former slaves, and get the 14th Amendment ratified was to mandate a more comprehensive reconstruction. The Reconstruction Act of 1867 thus placed the South under temporary military rule, mandated the formation of new governments that were elected by white and black voters, and required new constitutions that enfranchised black men. Only then was the 14th Amendment ratified. As Foner writes, here indeed is a profound irony. The framers of the 14th Amendment studiously avoided including black suffrage among its provisions, but without the votes of black men in Southern elections and legislatures, the amendment would never have become part of the Constitution. These events also created a Republican consensus on the need for a specific suffrage amendment. Reconstruction governments in the South enfranchised African Americans as they had to, but how long would those governments remain in power? And what about the tens of thousands of black men in states outside the former Confederacy who were still denied the right to vote? Even conservative Republicans like Senator William M. Stewart of Nevada insisted that suffrage was the only measure that will really abolish slavery and guarantee that each man shall have a right to protect his own liberty. Congress could have written a positive amendment, one that would have established a uniform national standard and enfranchised virtually all citizens, rather than a negative amendment that merely barred racial exclusions but left other qualifications to the states. The torturous debates revealed conflict between principle and practicality. Many feared, probably rightly so, that voters in the North and West would reject an amendment that established an affirmative right to vote. Widespread prejudice along lines of race, nationality, religion, and class, not least legislators in the West, California, and Oregon, who were fearful of the potential of enfranchising Chinese, prevented a more robust guarantee. In the end, congressional Republicans heeded the advice of Wendell Phillips, whose article in the National Slavery Standard implored, for the first time in our lives, we beseech Republicans to be a little more politicians and a little less reformers. An amendment enfranchising black citizens, he argued, was all the ground the people are ready to occupy. The amendment then asserted impartial suffrage, that is, it mandated the same standards for black and white voters, rather than manhood or even universal suffrage. Nonetheless, Foner reminds us that the 15th Amendment was a remarkable achievement. It affirmed 
that only a few years after the death of slavery, African Americans were now equal members of the body politic. Fomer's book then turns to congressional efforts to enforce these amendments and with them, a new national citizenship and set of rights. Note that each amendment includes an enforcement clause. The Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The first part of chapter four, Justice and Jurisprudence, shows us what it looked like when a generation of Republicans nurtured in anti-slavery politics wielded the powers won in the second founding to protect citizens' rights to personal safety, civic belonging, and democratic participation. In other words, for what young people call a hot minute, the federal government implemented a fairly broad interpretation of the amendments. Congressional Republicans responded to continued white terrorism in the South with appropriate legislation to enforce the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Three enforcement acts in 1870 and 1871 dramatically expanded federal power to protect citizens against acts of violence that deprived them of constitutionally guaranteed rights. They asserted that security of person and property was a fundamental right of all persons, and they made it a federal crime to use force or intimidation or to conspire to deprive citizens of their right to vote, serve on juries, or otherwise enjoy equal protection of the law. They authorized the use of federal force to suppress such violence and gave jurisdiction of these crimes to federal courts. They explicitly declared that the failure of state officials to provide protection against violence was itself, quote, a denial by such state of the equal protection of the laws. As one member of Congress put it, if a state by inaction could allow the rights of citizens to be trampled upon without color of law, of what avail is the Constitution to its citizens? The Grant administration wielded these new powers to crush the Ku Klux Klan and bring nearly 2,500 criminal cases, most for conspiracy to deprive a person of equal protection of the laws. But as we know, such enforcement did not continue much past the 1880s. The second part of the chapter illustrates how the virulence and persistence of the second founding's opponents, the resistance of many elites to the expansion of federal power, and broader shifts in the political winds squandered the second founding's promise of a more egalitarian multiracial democracy. Federal power passed to a new generation of Republicans who didn't have roots in anti-slavery politics, and to a Democratic Party explicitly avowing white supremacy. Northern voters got tired of what they saw as the constant problems in the South, and mass immigration helped to reinvigorate racism and white supremacy in American culture more broadly. Foner pays particular attention to the Supreme Court's interpretations of the Reconstruction Amendments. I read his description of the 24 men who served on the court between 1870 and 1900, just as President Biden was announcing his appointment of Katanji Jackson as the next Supreme Court Justice. Of course, all of these men were white and men. Almost all of them came from privileged backgrounds and had made their livings defending and representing corporations. Few of them had any real contact with African-Americans and few had connections to the pre-war anti-slavery movement and its egalitarian constitutionalism. All of this means that they were perhaps less inclined than others may have been to prioritize protecting the rights of African-Americans. And Foner doesn't let these justices off the hook. Yes, we see this broader change in the political culture and retreat from reconstruction, but he writes, the court's narrow reading of the constitutional amendments was a choice, not something predetermined by public opinion or historical context. The justices did not simply reflect popular sentiment, they helped to create it. Their interpretation of the Reconstruction Amendments denied the very notion of a second founding. Their rulings ignored the intent of Congress, the very discussions that Foner has made us privy to, and defended a traditional pre-war model of federalism, citizenship, and rights. Now, I can't 
uh, cover this comprehensively, but I'll take you through a few of the decisions that Foner discusses to illustrate the point. And, and I'm, I'm gonna frame this around a few key questions. So did the 13th Amendment mean more than just ending chattel slavery? We already learned that African Americans and even moderate Republicans believed that yes, it meant destroying the badges and incidents of slavery, that is racially discriminatory policies and practices. In several cases, the Supreme Court ruled differently. Most famously, the plaintiffs in Plessy v. Ferguson of 1896 argued that Louisiana's Separate Car Act imposed on black people a badge of inferiority, thereby violating the 13th Amendment. They also charged that the law violated the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection. The court rejected both arguments. It ruled that segregation was a reasonable exercise of the state's police power. If segregation was not a badge or incident of slavery, what was though? Justice Henry B. Brown made it clear that this ruling was no neutral interpretation of constitutionality. It was a wholesale rejection of racial equality and the power of government to ensure equal citizenship. If one race be inferior to the other socially, he wrote, the Constitution of the United States cannot put them on the same plane. What exactly were the privileges and immunities of citizenship that the national government was bound to protect? The extensive lists of rights enumerated in the Civil Rights Act of 1866 suggested a fairly clear answer, but in a series of rulings, the Supreme Court whittled them down to virtually nothing, unless you were a corporation, which is another story. A slim majority in the slaughterhouse cases of 1873 ruled that the 14th Amendment protected only those rights that before the second founding had derived from national citizenship. And this was a very short list, the right to use navigable waters and seaports, to be protected on the high seas, and to seek redress of grievances from the federal government. Plaintiffs continued to press. Myra Bradwell argued that her exclusion from the Illinois bar violated her right to practice a profession. Virginia Minor argued that a Missouri registrar's refusal to allow her to cast a ballot violated her right to vote. The court found that neither the right to practice a profession nor the right to vote was a privilege or immunity that is a right of citizenship. As Foner puts it, the court essentially eviscerated the privileges and immunities clause. Did the federal government have a duty to protect the rights of a citizen against violations by private actors? In a series of rulings, Foner illustrates that the court elevated the so-called state action doctrine into a shibboleth, absolving the government of its obligation and its power to protect African Americans from both vigilante violence and discrimination by private citizens and businesses. In the Colfax massacre of 1873, an armed white mob murdered scores of black men in a Louisiana courthouse. Federal officials under the Enforcement Act indicted 90 persons for conspiracy to deprive the victims of their constitutional rights. The Supreme Court overturned the convictions of the three men who were eventually tried and convicted. They argued that the 14th Amendment protected citizens only against actions by the state, not by private citizens. Of course, murder and conspiracy were state crimes, but state and local officials almost never held white perpetrators accountable. Consider that just this week, the Senate passed the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill, ensuring that it would become law. In, it's 2022. It's taken more than a century, during which Congress failed to pass more than 100 anti-lynching bills to legislate a federal national right to be free from racially motivated violence by private citizens. The Equal Justice Initiative has documented more than 4,000 lynchings between 1877 and 1950. In the Civil Rights Act of 1875, Congress sought to protect all citizens in their civil and legal rights, in part by mandating equal treatment in public accommodations, whether those were publicly or privately owned. In the civil rights cases of 1883, the Supreme Court cited the state action doctrine to rule the public accommodations provision unconstitutional. 
Justice John Marshall Harlan's stinging dissent attacked this ruling on several grounds. Harlan, who Foner notes was the only justice on the court at the time who had actually owned a slave, pointed out that the businesses convicted of violating the law were licensed by the state and performed a public service. Thus, they were agents or instrumentalities of the state. He reminded his colleagues that the court had upheld fugitive slave acts, which punished private individuals for interfering with the right of citizens to their property in slaves. And he also rejected wholesale the argument that the 14th Amendment only applied to state action. Foner quotes the editors of the Harrisburg Telegraph to sum up Republican response to these rulings. It seems that now, as long ago, freedom cannot be made safe in the United States as long as we have a Supreme Court. Did the 14th Amendment's assurance of equal protection of the law prohibit laws that did not mention race, but that in practice discriminated against one or more racial group? The court started out saying yes. In Yik Wo v. Hopkins of 1886, the court ruled on a San Francisco ordinance that regulated commercial laundries. It ruled that although the ordinance was, quote, fair on its face and impartial in appearance, close quote, it was being applied and administered in a discriminatory manner against Chinese-run businesses, and thus it amounted to a, quote, practical denial by the state of legal equality. But a decade later, the court had changed its tune. Plaintiffs challenged Mississippi's 1890 constitution, which included various measures designed to disenfranchise black voters, including a poll tax and an understanding clause. The plaintiffs charged this as a violation of the 15th amendment. The court acknowledged the clear evidence that the convention had designed these provisions specifically to exclude black voters. But because this was not written in the Constitution, the court held it constitutional. In 1903, Jackson Giles, president of the Alabama Negro Suffrage Association, challenged Alabama's new voting qualifications as racially biased. Writing for the court's majority, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes admitted that the court was effectively powerless to stop white supremacists from depriving black citizens of their political rights. If the great mass of the white population intends to keep the blacks from voting, he wrote, the court could not stop them. Foner then looks ahead. Federal retreat from enforcing the amendments and judicial narrowing of their meaning meant that for decades, African-Americans were denied civil and political rights. In the 1960s, the federal government again set out to enforce those rights though not as, assertive, as assertively as it might have. Foner notes, by the way, that we didn't need new constitutional amendments in the 60s for the second reconstruction, for, the, um, for this moment, because the potential right, of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment is that all we needed to do was to actually enforce these amendments. Foner points out, though, that even in the 60s, even under the Warren Court, the Supreme Court refused to repudiate the state action doctrine. Instead, it turned to the Interstate Commerce Clause to uphold the prohibition of discrimination by private business. He writes, this elevation of the Commerce Clause into a charter of human rights, a way of compensating for the Supreme Court's cramped view of the Reconstruction Amendments has made the judiciary look ridiculous. But relying on the 14th Amendment would mean repudiating a century and a half of jurisprudence. At the same time, activists mobilized the 14th Amendment to claim new rights and win protection from discrimination by a range of factors, including gender, age, and disability. Okay, so this is Foner's story. This is the story he tells. Why, in the end, does Foner want us to understand this history? What does he want us to learn? By looking at the range of ideas that contributed to the second founding, and by tracing the rapid evolution and thinking about rights and citizenship, Foner demonstrates that there's no one true meaning of citizenship, liberty, equality, rights, and the proper location of political authority. Each was, 
and continues to be highly contested. In other words, the creation of meaning is an ongoing process. By detailing the contests over their meaning in the 1860s and 70s, and this rapid evolution in thinking, he wants to suggest a more that more robust interpretations of the amendments are possible, as plausible, if not more so, in terms of the historical record than how the Supreme Court has, in fact, construed them. Put another way, the counter-interpretation developed in Reconstruction and its aftermath, with its more powerful assertion of the rights enshrined in the Constitution by the Second Founding and the power of the federal government to enforce them, remains available if the political environment changes. The point, Foner insists, is not that the counter-interpretation is the one true meaning of the Reconstruction Amendments, but there, there are viable alternatives. Alternatives, he says, rooted in the historical record, which would infuse the amendments with greater power. And that's what I've got. Thank you, Marissa. Um, I'd like to open this up now to questions. Um, there should be a feature of GoToWebinar that allows you to type in a question, and I will read them out to Marisa as they come in. I have one to get us going here. Um, it is, we had a bloody civil war, three constitutional amendments, and a hundred years later, two major pieces of civil rights legislation the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Which type of intervention do you think was the most influential in changing our culture with respect to race? Wow. <laughs> um, so, you know, historians always try to get out of these questions with, uh, you know, pointing to complexity, right? <laughs> Nuance and complexity. Um, you know, I I think that the historical consensus is that um, these factors work together. Um, so I think that historians say, yeah, it, we needed a civil war to end slavery, um, at least to end it um, immediately um, uh, and probably even gradually. Um, I think that it takes all of these powers. I, I think, you know, what, what this collection of, you know, it's taken war, it's taken, um, uh, it's taken legislation, it's taken enforcement of that legislation, it's taken um, a court willing to uh, stand up for, um, you know, the, the, the primacy of certain rights over other rights, um, shows us that sadly, I guess, that, um, that perhaps, we've sort of never solidified a full consensus on the part of, of um, an overwhelming majority of Americans that um, that race doesn't matter or shouldn't matter in terms of um, access to rights. Um, that's all I can say. Sorry, I can't offer a more uh, definitive answer. I'm not seeing any other questions yet. Um, I'm going to give a minute for people to compose their thoughts and put something in. Please do. I will say, so while we're waiting, um, if you haven't read the book, um, you know, Foner's written extensively on, on the history of Reconstruction, and there's an appendix in the book that gives um, some of this history of kind of the, you know, the the fight between Andrew Johnson and congressional Republicans over Reconstruction. It gives us more sort of context of what actually was happening on the ground in Southern states during Reconstruction. Um, so I think, you know, if, if you don't know that history yet, that's a useful place to even go before you read um, the rest of the book. Well, I think you've encapsulated it very well. <laughs> um, I would like to invite uh, the other co 
organizers on stage, Connie and Deborah, to come back up. Thank you, Marisa, uh, for that very comprehensive view uh, of Reconstruction and the the history. Of, uh, I may interrupt, Connie. We just oh. got a question. Oh, good. good. Can I? Oh, to be several questions. I didn't give oh. enough time. My apologies. Okay, I will uh, roll you back into this in a few minutes, probably. Okay. okay. There we go. Disappear again. Um, in what ways does current federalist movement doctrine suggest a return to policies promoted by the court after the Civil War? Um, yeah, uh, so uh, it, it does. You know, I, th I think one of the reasons for arguing for a second founding is that the kind of jurisprudence that um, most conservative jurists rely on is a vision of federalism that goes back to how they see it to the founding fathers, right? Um, and I think what Foner is er, is arguing is that if we think of the Reconstruction Amendments as a second founding, it offers a different model of federalism, right? Um, and so, you know, do you go back to what you think um, the quote unquote founding fathers believed about federalism, or do you go back to what um, the generation that had passed through civil war and had to sort of rethink these questions um, thought about federalism, right? Um, and, and that's the key difference. And, and there continues to be this, um, this strong, um, this strong emphasis on the founding fathers and a kind of uh, allowing the states to have much more uh, power and limiting federal power. Um, you know, I also think what, what was startling to me about the book, I guess something that I hadn't thought of before, as much as I've read about and taught uh, the, the civil rights movement of the 20th century, was that reliance on the Commerce Clause, right? Um, that that even the Warren Court, right, the most liberal court um, and most active court in trying to protect the rights of, of African Americans was unwilling to kind of uh, overturn uh, those sort of sharp limits on the possibilities of the Reconstruction Amendments. Thank you. I have another one, uh, several others actually, although at one o'clock we'll start to tie things up. What do you see as the likelihood that there will be a new birth of freedom racially and for others in the current political context? <laughs> see, I'm a historian. I look at the past, not the future. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, I, I think going back to Foner's book, right? seeing how sort of rapidly um, these transformations in thinking about rights and citizenship and federal power happened, um, you know, makes one think that that such a kind of transformation might happen again. Now, it took a, a bloody war, you know, a horrible war for that to happen. Um, so who knows, right? Um, I think it does matter. Um, as I, Foner argues, it doesn't matter sort of who is sitting in particular positions of power, uh, like on the Supreme Court. It, it also matters, um, you know, we got we got both the first Reconstruction and and the second Reconstruction, as it's called, of the of the, the 1960s, because um, there were many many people who were willing to sacrifice a lot um, to demand it. Right. Um, it had to do with with deep, intense grassroots organizing and activism and demands. And, and um, so, you know, I think that's one lesson of history and that's worth attending to. Thank you. Here's another one. Does the Supreme Court have the real power when it comes to enforcing enforcing voting rights or Congress or the states? What is the path forward? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
I mean, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court doesn't have any enforcement power at all, right? <laughs> it's a group of nine people <laughs> um, who declare things, right? Um, the system sort of, it, it, it they, they don't have an army, right? Um, so, I mean, I, I think that it, it takes every level. I don't, you know, I'm not smart enough to think of what's, what's the way forward in a circumstance where um, the courts shut down, you know, the, the, the possibilities of, um, enforcing voting rights um i i it's easier for me to think of the possibilities of when when congress doesn't do that and that's back to you know efforts to to organize and and be involved politically and try to make change happen we also see you know um at the state level you know the states in the progressive era were sort of viewed as the laboratories of democracy um so we see much different things happening depending on what state one is in so um um yeah that's a messy ugly non-answer to your question apologies Thank you. Another one. Can you uh, speak to the differences in Republicans and Democrats and their respective positions relative to civil rights during Reconstruction? Yeah, during Reconstruction, yes. So the Republican Party was formed explicitly as an anti-slavery party. Um, so, uh, you know, the, Re the Republican Party um, in regards to slavery was anti-slavery in regards to civil rights was was not completely on the same page but um, you had radical Republicans who were sort of the most active in pushing for um, a, a kind of robust sense of rights um, uh, for African Americans and for people in general. Um, and you had moderate Republicans who would go along with the radicals on that when it seemed necessary um, to accomplish political goals um, that they had. The Democratic Party at this time um, was pretty much um, a validly white supremacist supremacist. Um, uh, I mean, it's it's more complicated than that, but in regards to reconstruction, um, Foner shows us in the book, you know, I, di I didn't spend any time really talking about uh, democratic opposition to a lot of these changes because it's sort of the same thing over and over again. You know, it, Democrats make two arguments. They argue that Blacks are inferior um, and don't deserve full citizenship rights, and they argue that the federal government doesn't have the power to enforce anything, right? That it's the states that have the primacy. So that's, you know, that that's less interesting <laughs> in the story than the kind of, you know, the Republicans were trying to figure out how far do we go and how do we how do we do this? Thanks. Um, I have another one for you. How close did FDR come to increasing Franklin Delano Roosevelt come to increasing the size of the Supreme Court? Oh yeah, I, you know I I don't know that story in great depth. Um, I, I don't think he came close, um, but I think that he accomplished what he what he wanted to accomplish with with the proposal, um, which was to. Uh, chase in the court in some sense to um uh to um you know the court was essentially striking down <laughs> his his new deal legislation um based on these notions this kind of conservative jurisprudence that the federal government has no power to do very much at all um and based on a kind of interpretation of due process that articulates a liberty of contract, um, which was a way of essentially preventing any government regulation of the labor market um, and, um, and preventing unionization. Um, so I, I think in the story, he doesn't get far, but I, you know, I think another piece of that story to remember is that there's no, the Constitution doesn't say that the Supreme Court has nine justices, right? Um, a lot of these things that many Americans just sort of think were written down by the founding fathers 
are, were not. They were sort of their, their convention, their tradition, their things that developed over time in complicated circumstances, um, and not the kind of written down law that, you know, that is revered. Um, so, you know, there's all this horror at the idea of changing how the Supreme Court operates, but that, you know, the, the way it operates now was a product of history. Thanks. I have another one here, and I'm not quite sure how to interpret it, but I'm going to just put it in your lap and see if you can do something with it. Can you address the problem of changing attitudes along with the laws? Yeah, I get I get that question. Um, uh, you know, and I, I think it relates in the story I, that Foner tells to this idea that um, the Supreme Court you know, th there are arguments that the Supreme Court can sort of only go so far as public opinion will allow it to go. Um, and, it, you know, it's more complicated than that, I think. I think Foner's making the case that, look, the court, um, yeah, the court in some senses is reflecting public opinion, and particularly um, the, the court worries because it doesn't have any way to enforce what it says, right? So it's sort of having to rely on uh, on legislators uh, to do that. Um, but also he doesn't let them off the hook, which I think is important, you know, that, that court opinions um, can shape also public opinion, right? So, you know, I'm sure there are social scientists who study this and like try to quantify, <laughs> try to quantify. But um, I think that it's a combination of things and that, um, you know, sometimes it takes political leaders to um, stake out something um, and move public opinion. That's their job. Um, that's it. Thank you. We're going to cap the questions there. Okay. Um, Connie and Deborah, would you please rejoin us? Well, now I'll say thank you again, and thank you for answering all of those far-ranging questions, <laughs> Marisa. And uh, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you to all of you in the audience for joining us today. And We'll look forward to seeing you next month. And now we'll say goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks.